All right, good morning. Welcome to Equipping Hour this morning. And uh, we're going to get started here. I'm going to open us in a word of prayer, and we'll begin our time together. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity this morning to look into your word. Uh, We pray that we would be indeed equipped by your word for every good work, uh, that we would think your thoughts after you, that we would bring our own uh, priorities, our own view of the universe into conformity with your truth. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning begins a two-part series in Equipping Hour. Uh, This morning, we'll be looking at man's problems. Next week, we'll be looking at God's solutions. And this is just fundamental to our existence. This is fundamental to our understanding as believers. We bring the problems to the table, and God brings the solutions. And so, if uh, if we end today and you feel hopeless, helpless, despairing, just longing for some sort of relief. It's coming next week. So there's your cliffhanger. You've got to come back next week or you'll just live the rest of your earthly life in depression. Uh, This morning, we're only talking about problems. Next week, we're talking about solutions. Uh, You can also stick around for the main service. There will be some hope there. Uh, So you don't have to wait all the way till next week. Uh, I love one of the stories from the life of Martin Lloyd-Jones. He was Uh, regularly preaching on Sundays uh, in his church, preaching in the mornings, uh, law, God's demands, and man's falling short of those demands. And in the evenings, he would preach the gospel. He would make sure that people understood the problem. And and he loved the sort of cliffhanger on Sunday afternoons. People would go to tea and uh, think about their problems and then come back for the answer on Sunday evenings. And he was preaching, as you know, during World War II. And there was a significant event where a a V-2 rocket hit a marine barracks down the street from the church. And uh, many people that had been coming to his church were killed in that blast. And he decided from that point forward, you know what? I'm not going to wait till Sunday evening for the gospel, for the answer. I'll make sure I get it in on Sunday mornings too. But at any rate, for equipping hour today, we're not doing that. It's all problems. Okay, A, A quote regularly attributed to John Wayne although there are reports that say he never said it. But it sounds like John Wayne, so I'm just going to quote it. Life is tough, but it's a whole lot tougher when you're stupid. Right? There are complications in life that have very much to do with us. And what I want to talk about is the toughness of life, how difficult life is, but it's a whole lot tougher because of sin. Because of sin. This morning we're examining homardiological complications of life. Homardiology is the study of sin. Now, hopefully the study of sin in a theoretical vacuum, not the experimental study of sin, if you know what I mean. Homardiological complications mean those difficulties that are brought about by the fact that sin exists. And this morning we're going to look at four homardiological complications that make life difficult. Us, Satan, the world and God himself. Because sin exists, these four elements, human depravity, Satan's activities, the world's pressures, and God's judgments, all make life for sinners really difficult. Really difficult, really challenging. And we begin just by thinking of the fact that God has cursed the earth Since Genesis 3, Ecclesiastes 7 says God has bent everything who can straighten it out. The answer to that rhetorical question is no one can straighten out what God has bent. And God has bent the universe so that gardens yield thorns and bees have stings and dogs have bites. I guess if we go down the the lyrical sheet of Sound of Music. And there's no solution to these things from man's side. This is God's doing. God was not going to allow access to the tree of life and to immortality and to immediate fellowship with him while we were sinners. No, Adam and Eve were told, you have to leave, and a cherubim with a flaming sword was placed at the gate. They could not get back into paradise. They could not get back into immediate fellowship where God walked in the cool of the day and people had conversations and everything was great. No, sin had to be covered. Sinners had to be exiled. And the whole rest of the Bible is the story of how do we get back? 
And so we live in that fallen world. It feels normal. It's all we've ever known. And so there's a normality to it. There's a sort of normality to human existence as sinners and under the effects of the sin and the fall that we've just become accustomed to. But it is not normal in the sense of God's highest design. In fact, sinfulness is not intrinsic to humanity. Is it necessary to sin if you are human? Must sinfulness be equal to humanity? The answer to that is no. You might be thinking, wow, this church just compromised in a big way. We believe in total depravity. It's in our doctrinal statement. What just happened in equipping hour? (laughs) Well, think about this. The Lord Jesus Christ was 100% human and never sinned. Adam and Eve, for a time, were human. (laughs) Pinnacle of God's creation. And for a time, did not sin. And for most of your existence, Christian, you will be unable to sin. In fact, mathematically, for nearly the entirety of your existence, you will not sin, you will not think about sin, you will not be able to sin. And that's good news. right? The math is eternity as over and against your earthly existence. So it's not intrinsic to humanity to sin. But we live in this phase of life where we do sin, and we can't escape sin, and we can't escape sin's consequences. We can't escape the effects of the fall and the judgment of God against sin. So sin just complicates everything. We're going to look at it together in four layers. And as we think about these things, there are things that are true about these four layers of complication that are true categorically of the unbeliever, but are true residually for the believer. Uh, our, our friend, Dr. George Zemeck, has called these homardiological hangovers in the Christian life. Right? These complications are true in totality for the unbeliever. They are true residually for the Christian walking in a mixed condition. Right? Some things have fundamentally changed. You're no longer a slave of sin, but you still experience the presence of sin. Okay, we'll talk about that. So, Especially next week when we get into solutions, uh, we'll talk about the solutions that only God can bring to each of these layers and what it means for the Christian life. For now, just speaking generally, let's think about depravity, human depravity. By the way, there, there are notes with lots of verses. I didn't put them up on the screen. You don't have handouts. I will put my notes up on the uh, outline on the website. So you can look at these later. You don't have to try to write down all of these references. I will have you turn in your Bible a little bit, and we'll be flipping to a number of them. When we think about human depravity, we think about it in in two separate categories. First of all, universal depravity, and secondly, total depravity. By universal depravity, we simply mean that every single human being sins by nature. And that sinful nature comes out in sinful activities, Uh, activities that nobody sees at the motive level, at the heart level, at the desire level, and sinful activities that make their way out in words and deeds. And that's true of every single human being. The Lord Jesus Christ accepted, 100% God, 100% man, every other human being since Adam and Eve has been depraved, universal depravity, right? We know this from all over the scriptures. Think for a moment uh, about Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. We'll come back to this verse when we think about total depravity. Okay, But just thinking first of all about universal depravity, this is true of every man. Uh, Genesis 6 says, All flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Genesis 8, 21, after the flood, the flood didn't solve the problem of human sinful complications. Uh, There were only eight people that survived the the worldwide catastrophic judgment flood of God in a little box floating on the top of the waves. And all eight of those people carried their sin nature into all of their progeny. So after the flood, Genesis 8, 21, God makes this same indictment. The intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. That is, with flood. 1 Kings 8.46 says, There is no man who does not sin. 
Job 15, uh, who, man who is born of a woman, uh, how can he be righteous? Psalm 14 says, there is no one who does good. They've all turned aside, together become corrupt. There's no one who does good, not even one. In Psalm 51, 5, David confesses uh, of his own sin, I was conceived in sin, and he's not throwing his mom under the bus, right? He's just saying, from the very beginning, from the womb, I am a sinner. Psalm 58, 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb, and they go astray from birth. Psalm 130, O Lord, if you should mark iniquities, who could stand? And the answer is nobody. Psalm 143, 2, no man living is righteous. Proverbs 20, verse 9, who can say, I've cleaned my heart, I'm pure from sin. Ecclesiastes 7, 20, there's not a righteous man on the earth who continually does good and never sins. Ecclesiastes 8, 11, because the sentence against the evil deed is delayed. The hearts of the sons of men are given more fully to do evil. Ecclesiastes 9.3, there is one fate for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil and insanity is in their hearts. Through all their lives, afterwards they go to the dead. Isaiah 53.6, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Uh, that is uh, most likely a reference of Israel, repentant Israel, looking back on their rejection of Christ and confessing their own sins, but seeing the universality of it amongst God's chosen nation. Jeremiah 17, 5, cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes man his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. In Matthew 7, 11, Jesus says of fathers who know how to give good gifts to their kids, you who are evil, Jesus says, know how to give good gifts. There's a category for relative good amidst universal depravity. Uh, image bearers in God's image can do relatively good things, not ultimately good things, right? Because everything that is not done in faith is sin before God. All our righteousness are as filthy rags. But not everything a sinner does is as bad as it could be. So helping a little old lady across the street or a father not giving his son a serpent or a scorpion but giving him bread, well, that's pretty good from an evil guy. God's indictment on these things is, universal. Jeremiah 17, 5, cursed is the man who trusts in mankind. Romans 3 gives the tirade, the culmination. He began in Romans 1 saying all those uh, outsider Gentiles, they're bad guys. And then all the religious Jews in chapter 2 are bad guys too. And he sums it up in case anybody was left out of religious, irreligious, Jew, Gentile. Is there another category? No, he says there is none righteous, not even one, Romans 3. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks for God. All have turned aside. They together have become useless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Romans 3.23, speaking out about those who have been justified. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace. That means every Christian <laughs> declared righteous by God was in the category of having fallen short of God's glory. How much more everybody else? Death spread to all men, on account of which all sinned, Romans 5.12. Again and again, I read you the first page and a quarter of a four-page universal depravity passage list. <laughs> Let's talk about total depravity. Total depravity means not just that everybody sins, but every single part of the human constitution is affected and infected by sin. Right? Sin is just not the outward deeds. Sin has to do with the inner man, the mission control center, if you want to call it that. Like NASA has a mission control center in Houston, and Houston calls the shots. The, the inner man, the heart, is affected by sin. Man has been totaled by sin. That is, his feelings are wrong not to be trusted. His thoughts are sinful and not to be trusted. His very nature from which all of these things spring is polluted, and a polluted well cannot produce the things that please God. 
It can only produce through the thoughts, the intentions, the motives, the desires, the affections, the will, the behavior, the whole panoply of the constitution of what makes man man. All of it is polluted because the fountain itself is polluted. This is what we mean by total depravity. Not that every human being has done as bad as he possibly could have, but that every aspect of the human constitution is sinful. And this is critical when we think about the way man thinks, right? If you're a philosopher, you love to use the word epistemology. It just means how we know what we know. And human epistemology is fundamentally flawed. You don't know right. You don't know correctly. You don't know how to know correctly in a depraved state. How are we to know truth? Dependently. We are sustained by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is to be our daily bread. Instead, what does sinful man want to do? I don't want God to tell me how to know. I know how to know. I know I know how to know. I'm going to know the way I want to know, and now I know. And it's independent epistemology. It is rebellious knowing. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Right? The atheist, think about this. The atheist who says there is no God is using God's air, standing on God's earth. Uh, some have said uh, being held up by God's very hands to throw a fist in God's face and say you don't exist. That's crazy. That's insanity. Romans 1 says he is suppressing the truth he actually knows about God in unrighteousness. That is, God exists and I know it, but I need to deny it so that I can live the way I want to live. So I'm going to put the knowledge of God that I know I have in my heart and I know that creation is screaming at me, Psalm 19. I'm going to take all of that and stuff it in a box, Romans 1, 18 and following. I'm going to sit on the lid while all of that knowledge is protesting with inside me. And you become a living schizophrenic, spending your entire life spinning your wheels trying to deny what you know at the heart level. This is why a guy like Richard Dawkins is just insane. This is the guy who said, there is no God, there is no God, there is no God. Darwinian evolution explains everything. And then one day he said, ooh, Darwinian evolution doesn't explain everything. There's problems. How do we get around those problems? I know magic genes, smart genes. There's not enough time in a four and a half billion year old, which is a made up number anyway, four and a half billion year old solar system for life to have emerged on our planet according to Darwinian evolution. So we need smart genes. The Cambrian explosion then is the explanation that the genes, the genetic coding, knew where they wanted to go in evolutionary development and made this miraculous, unbelievable, out-of-the-box, unscientific leap to skip all the Darwinian process and get life to where it needed to be. Well, that theory didn't get much traction in the scientific world. And he came up with another theory. He chucked smart genes and he replaced it with, anybody know? Aliens. <laughs> Seriously. He said, well, four and a half billion years is enough time to get Darwinian evolution going. So meanwhile, what's inside the truth box that he's stuffed inside and sitting on the lid and it's bouncing around inside him all the time? God exists and I know it, but I have to find another way to suppress it. Aliens. <laughs> Some life form from outside of our solar system came and advanced the gene pool, either by uh, putting the Cambrian explosion here in place or just advancing the things in such a way that we could accelerate the process. Friends, that's just insane. And he'll come up with something else when that's discredited. Of course, it's hard to discredit aliens if we can't find them. Can't prove what I can't find. The agnostic is no better, by the way, When we think about how humans know what they know in their rebellion against God, ah, gnosis, ah, gnosko. Gnosko is the Greek verb, I know. Gnosis is knowledge. Ah, gnosis, you know, like when you put an A in the front of something, moral, ah, moral, right? To muse means to think. What what does it mean to ah, muse? Well, that's interesting. We go to an amusement park. Why? Chuck my brain at the door and just have some fun. Um, agnosis, agnosco, is where we get ignoramus and agnostic. Well, I can't prove there's no God, so I'm just going to live in this rebellious indifference. 
Well, that's terrifying. The, the truth box is still, still rattling underneath you as you suppress it unrighteousness. And the created world around us is still Psalm 19 wanting. It's yelling, screaming out the glory of God. And you've just chosen to say, I don't care. I don't want to know. I'm, I'm an ignorant person. A, a really open-minded, thoughtful agnostic. Really. John 3, 19 to 21, Jesus says, here's the diagnosis from heaven. Light has come into the world, speaking about himself. And men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Man's problem is not an intellectual one. Man's problem is a moral one. Man's problem is a problem of corruption from the heart that works its way out into every aspect of who he is. That's what we mean by total depravity. You can't even think straight, much less feel right, judge right, do right, motive right. Theologians call this effect on the mind the noetic effects of sin. You may, have, you may remember the old TV commercial that was an anti-drug campaign, frying pan and an egg. Some of you remember TVs. That was another era. Crack the egg. Oh, this is your brain. Here's the egg. Fry, sizzling frying pan. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs, right? Um, the noetic effects of sin has to do with this is your brain on depravity, <laughs> It's a fried egg. You, you don't think straight. So to trust the way I think and the way I judge and the way I motive and the way I perceive as a sinner is fundamentally problematic. Don't trust yourself. That's why Jeremiah 17, 9 is true about the human state. Uh, the human heart is wicked, deceitful above all other things. Who can know it? We don't typically think about ourselves that way. Uh, but that's the truth from heaven. It starts from a thorough internal corruption. Job 14 asks, who can make the clean out of the unclean? The answer is nobody. Sin originates in the inner man. Jesus said you'll know people by their fruits. You don't gather grapes from thorn bushes. Right? It, it'd be nice sometimes if you could just go get whatever fruit you wanted off of whatever plant was out there. That's not how plants work. Right? You can't get grapes from thorn bushes. The tree has to be made good to get good fruit. Jesus said in Matthew 15, Out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and slanders. These things come from the heart. Disney says, trust your heart. Follow your heart. The Bible says, don't do that. Heart's a bad place. Heart of man is a bad place. And again, this is true categorically for the unbeliever. It is true in residual form for the believer, right? Um, just because we're new in the gospel does not mean you can now trust your inclinations, trust your feelings, trust your premonitions, trust your judgments, trust your thinking, <laughs> I grant that we can take the new heart language from Israel in the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, and apply it to Gentile benefits in the new covenant. Okay, there's big theological asterisks there. There's about 14 sermons behind that. I grant that we could take the heart of stone into a heart of flesh language from Ezekiel and apply it to new realities in the new covenant where Gentiles participate in spiritual blessings that were promised to Israel. I grant that. So let's just assume new heart language for the Christian life. What's new about a new heart for a Christian? Is it new by total replacement? No, it's new by addition. What's been added to you are new inclinations, new desires, new loves. Behold, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And, and, and all of life is new. You've got a new categorical disposition towards sin. But what is not new, what is a holdover from your old pre-Christian days is sin's presence, sin's activities, sin's enticements, sin's temptations, and sin's nature in the polluted well. Uh, what was 100% all pollution all the time when you were an unbeliever is now a mixed Fountain of things. So even though we're talking about total depravity categorically in terms of unbelievers and total inability to please God, you, Christian, have an ability to please God, but you still must distrust yourself. 
right? You can read through the Proverbs and find about a dozen verses that say, don't trust you. <laughs> That's a helpful exercise. And, and by the way, the, those Proverbs, the don't trust yourself Proverbs, were written to people who ostensibly feared God, were in a right relationship to God by faith. That's not an evangelistic message. That's a godly living message. Don't trust yourself. If I don't trust myself, if I'm not supposed to be independently knowing things, what am I to do? Entrust yourself to God and His Word. Learn to think His thoughts after Him. Take your thoughts captive and make them submit to Christ. That's another sermon too. All right, that's enough depravity. That's enough uh, thinking about the human condition. Uh, that is the, the, the first complication we have to think about in living in a sinful world, a broken world, a cursed world, is thinking about what goes on in my own heart. Who was I outside of Christ? If you're not in Christ this morning, uh, you're dead in your transgressions and sins, and you're fundamentally unable in your own strength to do anything about it that would please God or get you out of your situation. That's just the truth. That's, that's God's assessment of the human condition. And one of the evidences, by the way, of that human condition is we deny it. What, what would sin love to do in the human heart? Sin loves to say, there's nothing to see here, nothing to correct here. You're fine just the way you are. That's actually a manifestation of our deep-seated sinfulness. That's complication number one. That's us, human depravity. Let's look at the second one, Satan. Satan. Satan is a serious complication for human existence. Satan is the fundamental liar and murderer. He was a deceiver in the beginning. He murdered the human race in a very real sense, brought death by temptation to Adam and Eve. Listen to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. <clears throat> Satan there is called the God of this world, and he is said to blind the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel in the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. If Satan has a business card, and, and it has some job descriptions on it, I mean, he's got some titles, right? He's got, he's got various names, some also known as, some aliases. But under to the job description set of ideas on his business card, it says, blind the minds of unbelieving world. What, what am I going to do today after I have my coffee? Or whatever he drinks in the morning. Blind the minds of unbelievers. It's part of his tasks. It's what he does. And he is called the God of this world. That not, of course, not capital G God. There is only one true God. But a small G God that takes his own uh, identity and his occupation to sort of try to usurp lordship over the world. He hates God's image bearers. He's tried to murder them from the beginning and all the way through. He hates God's plan. He hates God's people. He loves nothing more than to interfere with what God would do with humanity. So he blinds the minds of unbelieving. This is, this is a serious homardiological complication. If you're an unbeliever uh, and you think truth is it's just out there, and all i got to do is, is look it up on Wikipedia, uh, get enough information, be smart, uh, use my own resources to understand things. You, you really have no idea what's going on in the world. Uh, some of you are, are more um, conspiratorial than others. Uh, some of you uh, sort of make a hobby, uh, could almost get a second job as conspiracy theorists. Uh, I think I probably gravitate to that a little bit. Just It's always interesting to think, oh man, uh, think of what was really going on behind the scenes. I can't prove it. That's what makes it a great conspiracy theory. But, uh, but enough bits and pieces of evidence to, to make a story, leave out the things that are contrary, build the narrative, find the bad guys, and just, man, I can publish this. Um, I love debunking conspiracy theories, uh, especially ones I have some personal knowledge about I, I, I was told at one point, uh, dealing with the, the conspiracy theory related to chemtrails, you can look it up later if you want, uh, but that's the idea that uh, the government is trying to change the way we think through the chemical 
uh, alteration of our brains by depositing chemicals through commercial aviation. Um, I happen to be a commercial pilot and a commercial mechanic. Uh, nobody installs dispensers of chemicals to alter. I'm just going to debunk that right here. If you want to know more about why that's a, a bad conspiracy theory, you can talk to me later. I pulled out my... <laughs> I pulled out my, uh, my licenses, my pilot's license and my uh, mechanic's license in a conversation one time and said, look, I, it's just not true. Um, airplanes can't even physically carry the kinds of chemicals you're talking about. It's just impossible to get off the ground. By the way, just I'll buy you a ticket on an airplane on a humid day out of Atlanta and you can watch how an airfoil creates a, a, a lower pressure system that emits an instantaneous cloud. It's not coming out of some hidden tanks. You can sit by the window, watch it happen over the wing. It's a contrail, as in condensation trail, where vapor condenses. You just watch it happen right through your own little laboratory window. It'll be great. I showed my license and <laughs> the, the young man I was talking to said, oh, I get it. You're in on it. <laughs> Like, oh man, <laughs> can't win. But even still, I still like conspiracy theories. I just think they're really entertaining. Um, I did say to this young man, there, there is a, a, a much bigger conspiracy than chemtrails. There is a much darker, more insidious conspiracy, and it's not a theory, it's reality. And, and there are world forces behind it. There is a diabolical cabal that is running things behind the scenes and every king has been in on it. Every president has been in on it. And you know those secret societies at Oxford, Cambridge, and Yale, and they do their little, they're all in on it too. And I was in on it. And you were in on it. And every human being since Adam and Eve, except the Lord Jesus Christ, has been in on it, and it's Satan's, and he is blinding the minds of unbelievers so that they will not believe the gospel. Why don't people believe the gospel? Because Satan is doing everything he can to keep people from getting to the truth. He buries it. He maligns the truth. He does everything he can in his power to tear it down. And that's not a theory. That's 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. This is a serious complication for the world around us. Sometimes we get into the, the delusion that we think, if I just give this person the right information, they will believe. Well, we've already seen the first complication that makes that impossible. Human knowing is fundamentally flawed. And the second complication that makes that really problematic is the great grand conspiracy of Satan working hard to blind every unbeliever at the mind level, at the thought level. Satan loves working in the realm of ideas. Sometimes we think, okay, I'm going I'm to stay from, away from Ouija boards and uh, necromancy and, I mean, all, all the kind of satanic stuff. I'm not going to Anton LaVey's church. I'm not going to read my Bible backwards and upside down. I'm not going to do any of that stuff. I'm going to stop listening to Hotel California. Whatever it is, I'm going to stay away from Satanism. Well, guess what? Satan is ubiquitous. He's everywhere. <laughs> And, and sure, does he pick off a few people by going, hey, worship Satan, pitchfork and horns, it's great over here. Highway to hell, ACDC, woo! I think he gets a lot more people parading in as, as an angel of light. Mixing in enough truth and enough niceties so that his deceptions are believable. This is a serious complication. Here's what Paul says to believers in 2 Corinthians 11. I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray for the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Listen, Christians are susceptible to satanic deception. Here's the categorical statement about unbelievers. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, Ephesians 2, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Look, you were in on that conspiracy theory. You were dead men walking. You were conscripted into Satan's empire. People are said to be held captive by Satan to do his will. 2 Timothy 2 1 John 3.10, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. 
John goes on to write, we know that we are of God, that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Listen, there is a fierce dichotomy between the children of God and the children of Satan, and you're either one or the other. Satan's activities, Satan's realm, his dominating presence are a serious complication for humanity. How does any human release himself from the grip of his own total depravity? And how does any human release him or herself from Satan's blinding influence? These are serious complications. There's a third one. Let's talk about the world. The world. And, and all we mean by the world, we sort of take uh, the, God, the Apostle John's normal usage of the word world here. Um, it is the anti-God, uh, socio-religious, political system, uh, authored, sponsored, ruled by Satan, and involving everybody that's not a believer. <laughs> That's the way John most often uses the word world. It's big and it's bad. It's opposed to God and his ways. Uh, by world, we mean in one sense collective depravity, right? We have universal, universal depravity, total depravity, but by the world, we mean what happens when a bunch of totally depraved people get together and make a society? What does that look like? What does that feel like? How is that driven? What do they like to do together? Um, when people get together, we always think, oh man, if we could just get together, think of the things we could accomplish, like the Tower of Babel. <laughs> uh, you know, they have those uh, motivational posters. There's a series of demotivational posters, right? And, and it has a really nice, pleasant saying and a, and a, and a wonderful picture, uh, well-framed, well-shot, great photography, and, and the little phrase under the knee, underneath and. And I think one of my favorite demotivational posters just said, oh, I lost it. I'm so sorry. Oh, it was about snowflakes. But then I got distracted because snowflakes has something to do with millennials. I don't even remember what that means. But yeah, it was a, it's a snowflake. It's just a snowflake before that word took on a different meaning. Okay, so go back to the old days when snowflake was just crystallized dihydrous oxide falling through the air making fluffy piles. Uh, there's no telling what kind of disaster can happen when you get a bunch of flakes together. And it's a picture of an avalanche. <laughs> that's, a, that's what we mean by collective depravity or the world. When you get a whole society of humanity in rebellion against God, suppressing the truth, pursuing their own passions, eating each other alive for self-preservation, and they decide to get together and do something great, what happens? Disaster. It's just disaster. And when all of that is together against God's people, right? When God's people are outnumbered by the world. In this room, we have some rest. There's some comfort. There's people in here that think like I do. We have the same worldview. We're both going to the, the same source of authority. We love God's word. And we, because of that, we love the same things. We're from all kinds of different backgrounds, and yet we gravitate towards God's truth because God's done a work in our heart. You go outside of this room, and you're outnumbered. You might be outnumbered in your home. You might be outnumbered in your neighborhood, on your sports team, at your school. You might be outnumbered at a Christian school. You might be outnumbered at a, a non-profit organization that claims to be Christian. You might be outnumbered uh, everywhere you go. That's a tough place to be. Because we deal with a thing called peer pressure. Right? Those people around us who think a certain way, live a certain way, love certain things, speak certain ways. And we tend to be like the people we're around. If you don't have your radar up, <laughs> walking into the world, you will likely be squeezed into its mold, right? That's the prohibition in Romans 12 too. Do not be squeezed into the mold of the world. There's a real threat there. If you're of the world and you walk into the world, you go, yeah, I like this mold. I helped build this mold. This mold's great. 
And somebody who isn't of the world walks into that realm, and it's an offense. It's like, whoa, 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 what are you trying to prove here, buddy? (laughs) Why are you trying to ruffle our feathers? It's like the guy who goes to work and works really hard. And there's a culture in that office of laziness. What happens when the hard worker shows up? All the lazy people get really uncomfortable. Well, if you're not of this world and you walk into this world with a different set of otherworldly priorities and evaluations, all of a sudden you're going to be prickly in the world. And the world can tolerate and like you as far as you're not a threat, but as soon as what you believe and what you say threatens who they are and what they do and what they're committed to, things get really uncomfortable. For the, for the unchristian world, for the, the worldly world, for the unbelieving world, on that highway to hell, uh, they grease the slide for one another to destruction. Right? Listen to Romans chapter 1. The downward spiral of universal and total depravity culminates in verse 32. Although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice all these terrible things are worthy of death... By the way, everybody has a moral compass. Everybody knows there's right and wrong. Everybody knows they're accountable for doing wrong. Everybody likes to hold everybody else accountable for violating their moral standards anyway, right? Someone that says to you, Christian, hey, you can't judge me. Uh, Wait a second. You just have a category for right and wrong. You told me what was wrong and you judged me. The, The hypocrisy of that is remarkable. But look what they do. They know that God... Uh, is opposed to these things. They know that sin is worthy of death. They not only continue to do those same things, but notice they give heartily, they give hearty approval to those who practice them. Why? Misery loves company. Depravity loves company. Right? There, there's a reason why um, the the constraints on society as they're being pulled away, as we watch in our own society now. Uh, makes for interesting bedfellows. Uh, People that were enemies at one point are suddenly becoming friends because I know, hey, if if I let that group over there throw off the shackles of morality and decency, well, I don't really like what they're doing, but man, over here, I can throw off my own shackles and get away with what I want. So they approve of each other and they applaud one another for breaking the boundaries and going into further and further rebellion against God in a downward spiral. We're seeing that in our own day. It's really remarkable what the pressure of the world does. And we are prohibited from being conformed to it. Jesus said in John 15, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. And then... The Apostle John writes, do not love the world nor the things in the world. Don't love them. The world, the collective depravity of people living out a life in rebellion against God, is a severe complication. For the unbeliever, it just normalizes sin and rebellion. Yeah, I mean, everybody's, everybody's doing this. I, I can do this. Why do I need to change? And you, sometimes you share the gospel with somebody... And they take comfort in the fact that 6.8 billion people can't be wrong, or whatever the number is of the unbelieving world. They can't all be wrong. So, I mean, God's got to be merciful to me if I'm not as bad as that guy over there. People justify their own sin because of the collective peer pressure of the world. Hey, everybody's doing it. And for the Christian, this creates a severe complication. Right? We're, we're tempted along those lines too. Look, everybody's doing it. It's sort of normal. We start to justify and normalize sinful things in our own attitudes because like a frog in a boiling pot, we don't recognize the water's getting hotter and hotter and around us the culture is going in more and more rebellion against sin and we grow up in it. It just feels normal. And we've got to perpetually be renewing our minds or we threaten our very spiritual lives. And then it becomes a severe complication for us as well because those that were around, teammates, schoolmates, classmates, coworkers, family members, they're in rebellion against God and they hate God. We tend to want to be liked 
not rejected. We're built for social interaction. That's a good thing. But when it turns into fear of man, we begin to succumb and change and compromise because the people we're around and the people that we have affections for are in rebellion against God and they've normalized sin. That makes it a challenge. Makes it an enticement for residual sin in the heart of a believer. And it makes it really easy for a world of unbelievers to continue to pursue sin and justify it in their own minds. All right, last homardiological complication. Uh, look, it, it's hard to get over human depravity. <laughs> it's hard to get rid of satanic blindness. You're not getting out of this world easy. <laughs> the last one's probably the most difficult. God himself postures himself as a complicating factor in the problem of man's sin. He is a complicating factor in the problem of man's sin. Theologians will call the, the feature we're about to talk about as judicial hardening. That is, I want my sin. I don't want God. And in response, God judges the sinner by giving him more sin. Giving him over to sin. Three times in Romans chapter 1, in that downward spiral of depravity, it is said, God gave them over to further depravity. And they pursued that, and God gave them over, and God gave them over. Well, this is a terrifying reality, that God himself would further complicate our sinful complications by judging sinners, not only by having his wrath abide over them, John 3, anybody who doesn't believe already has God's wrath abiding over him, but you may very well get what you ask for when you ask God to leave you alone and leave you to yourself and leave you to your own devices and just let me do me, God might just let you do that. God said he would judge Egypt by hardening Pharaoh's heart. And then you see the interchange in Exodus. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. God hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Obviously all of the Lord. And yet Pharaoh was an active agent in stiffening his neck, stiffening his resistance against God. And look, you're not going to win that battle. And God gave him over to further and further hardness of heart. Proverbs 29.1 says, A man who hardens his neck after much reproof will suddenly be broken beyond remedy. A couple of years ago, Omri preached a sermon from Proverbs 1. I would commend that to you. It's on the website dealing with Proverbs 1 and wisdom's invitation to the life uh, of a naive one, a simple one, when rejected, becomes wisdom's judgment against that one, uh, even a giving over into more folly. Psalm 81, 12, so I gave them over to the stubbornness of their heart to walk in their own devices. Acts 7.42, God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven. Romans 1, 24, 26, 28, God gave them over. 2 Thessalonians 2, for this reason God will send upon them in a future apostasy a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. God will give them over to a deluding influence so they will believe what is false in order that they may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. Galatians 6, do, no, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. 2 Timothy 3.13, evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Listen, that is promised by God. It is in the plan of God that there would be deceivers and people would be given over to them. I want you to look finally at Matthew chapter 13. Really tragic illustration of this judicial hardening. Matthew 13, verse 1, That day Jesus went out and was sitting by the sea, and large crowds gathered to him. He got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd was standing on the beach, and he spoke many things to them in parables. And sometimes we have the attitude when we read the parables and the gospel accounts, we're like, oh, what cute stories. Oh, Jesus was so good at illustration. 
oh man, this is really cool how we can read the parable and then right after that read the commentary on it that Jesus gives. Boy, isn't this great? Well, it is great for us. But think about what it meant for an entire crowd of people to come and hear Jesus. And up until Matthew 13, Jesus has spoken plainly to the crowd. But starting in chapter 13, there is a fundamental shift. And now Jesus' public ministry is limited to confusing stories, confounding stories, hidden meanings. The disciples are bewildered. Verse 10, they came and said to Jesus, why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus, this is not a good teaching technique. Jesus answered them, to you it has been granted, graced, given, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, the crowds amassed to hear him speak, it has not been given. What happened? What happened between Jesus' clear public ministry and now this private explanation ministry to the disciples while only teaching in parables publicly? What happened? Matthew 12. Matthew 12 happened. Jesus performed sign after sign after sign demonstrating that he was, in fact, the chosen one, the Messiah, the anointed one on the earth. He was God in the flesh. And they rejected with hard-hearted stubbornness. The religious leaders, the very people that should have been telling everybody, look, Messiah's coming, here's what the word says, we should expect him. They should have been saying, ooh, would Messiah do more than this? This has to be him. I mean, who can make the lame walk and the blind see and the deaf hear? Who can cast out demons with a word and who raises the dead? What they should have said was, we want to be on that guy's team. He's stronger than death. Instead, they said, oh, he's getting popular. He'll take away our power. We need to put him to death. What a tragic rejection of God in person. And then when Jesus cast out demons, they said, oh, yeah, it's just a, just a little trick he's doing. He's actually in league with the devil. They've got this little agreement, and he, he's, he's on the same team as Satan, and he casts out demons by the power of Beelzebul. He's, he's actually satanic. Jesus' response says, well, you can say a lot of things about the Son of Man, but you can't talk about the Holy Spirit that way. That's the unpardonable sin. By the way, if you've ever thought that you've committed the unpardonable sin and just didn't know it, you haven't. Jesus is speaking very specifically about a very specific event in Matthew 12 that is not repeatable today. They rejected the clear messianic work of Jesus and they blasphemed the Holy Spirit by crediting the Holy Spirit's power to Satan himself in rejecting Messiah. And Jesus says, that's it. Not speaking to you clearly anymore. It's been a grace of God that you've heard the word clearly from God himself on the flesh up until Matthew 12. Now Matthew 13 forward, parables only. This is judgment. This is judicial hardening. This is judicial obscuring of truth for the masses. Now, the parables themselves become clear. I mean, the explanations in the word of God. The perspicuity of God's word is not at stake. But be careful what you ask for. You stiff arm God, he might give you the distance you think you want. Phil Kagey used to sing the song, Give me stone silence, cried the deaf man. Give me pitch darkness, said the blind man. Give me straight folly, cried the fool. Because I didn't believe Sunday school. God may give you what you want. I want more darkness. I want more folly. I want more rebellion. I want more sin. What a terrifying reality. And a very serious complication of the state of mankind. (laughs) Categorically for those dead in transgressions and sins. And for Christians who still wrestle with the residue of sin. A lot of big problems there. Uh, Frankly, impossible to solve. Uh, God is in the business of doing the impossible, giving life where there is only death, giving faith where there's only rebellion. We'll talk about those next week. So before you dismiss in hopelessness and despair, I will give thanks in advance for next week's 
equipping hour on God's solutions. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this very real, tragic, sobering, accurate indictment of our natural state. How tragic it would be if we whitewashed it, if we ignored it, if we pretended that it were not the case. But how glorious, how wonderful it is when we are impoverished of spirit and we come to you open-handed, bankrupt, and we say, we have nothing, God, will you rescue? We look forward to hearing about how you and you only can overturn each of these serious complications of sin. We thank you even in advance for them in Jesus' name.